So uh, I'm Herschel Nackless from the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy in the Department of Government uh, here at the college. And it's wonderful to welcome Professor Anna Kirkland here to Dartmouth. So Anna Kirkland is the Arthur, w, excuse me, Arthur F. Thurnau Professor uh, and Associate Professor of Women's Studies and Political Science at the University of Michigan. Uh, she holds a PhD and a JD from Berkeley's JSP program and is the author of two books, uh, The Brand New and Fantastic Vaccine Court, about which she will speak to us today. Uh, her 2008 book uh, on uh, fat rights, dilemmas of difference, and personhood. She's the co-editor of her third book with her colleague Jonathan Metzl called Against Health, How Health Becomes a New Morality, and uh, a dozen or so other fantastic articles. Um, uh, Professor Kirkland, to my mind, is one of the most interesting health policy and law scholars uh, out there. Some of you might recall a few years ago uh, President Obama sort of talking about his foreign policy and describing it to uh, Jeff Goldberg of The Atlantic with something that's come to be known as the Obama Doctrine, which is basically, uh, to paraphrase, don't do stupid stuff. Uh, now, in a similar spirit, it might be said of Professor Kirkland's work that her doctrine is something along the lines of just study interesting stuff. And this book, uh, The Vaccine Court, about which she'll speak today, is exactly that. She explores how an institution that almost none of us have ever heard of uh, is essential to upholding what she describes as our vaccine social order and is constitutive of an incredible public health success. The, the book not only explains the origins, evolution, and functioning of this essential political institution, but also illuminates our vaccine social order and vaccine policy more generally clarifies contemporary vaccine controversies, uh, and does this all in, in about 200 pages. Uh, this is a deeply researched account that remains even-handed, empathic, and discovers what is in many ways a controversial and imperfect, but nonetheless tremendously important success story in American policymaking. So this is the story about which she'll speak today, and uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Kirkland to Dartmouth. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Is the mic working? Thank you so much for having me here, and especially thanks to Joanne and Herschel for inviting me and giving me such wonderful hospitality. This is my first trip to Dartmouth and first trip to New Hampshire, so I'm, I'm enjoying myself very much. Let's see. So the main questions that I explore in the book, the central question of the book is really, how do we come to know what counts as a vaccine injury? And by we, I mean our, our whole society, but of course we have institutions that help us to figure this out. So how do we come to know and recognize what counts as real, what gets validated, what gets compensated? And then I ask, why does it matter that we do it in this court? We could do it in different ways through different types of institutions, and we in the United States have, have decided to do it in the most American of ways by creating a court and paying attorneys to fight it out. And so then what I ask is, how do these controversies and their attempted settlements produce and ma maintain our immunization social order? And by immunization social order, I mean all of the goods that we secure through having widespread immunization. So the most obvious, of course, is freedom from infectious disease. Um, and this is an absence. We, we don't notice it. Right, uh, which makes it harder to appreciate. But if you think about it and attempt to quantify it, it is there and we can come to understand it. And I think of it as really robustly politically created. It's created by law. Um, it's created by laws. It's created by social coercion, social control, and it produces disputes. So in this sense, I think of vaccines as thoroughgoingly political. And Obviously, they are techno-scientific, and they have many, there are many other things as well. But one thing I wanted to accomplish in the book is just really deeply situating them in law, policy, and social life. And so finally, I ask how, you know, we have a certain way of, of organizing these disputes and solving them. Is this good for our democratic politics? What does it reflect about our democratic politics? And what should we think of that? And I do give a normatively positive answer to that in the book. So. First, let me tell you a little bit about what I will cover in the talk. I'll speed through a lot of stuff. I could go on and on about this for, for a very long time, but I'll, I'll keep to these first few points um, 
just telling you what is the vaccine court, how does it settle these controversies and with what evidence. And then I'll close by uh, talking about how exactly the vaccine court produces and maintains our immunization so, immunization social order. I have extra slides on these other topics <laughs> that I had to take out of the body of the main talk. So if you are at all interested in seeing these other slides, um, I'll be happy to talk about those. I have a new project um, that I've just gotten an NSF grant for. I could talk about that. And there's plenty of other things I'm going to have to skip over. So first, there's, there's kind of a lot of detailed wind up here that's since, uh, as Herschel pointed out, nobody really knows what the vaccine court is. Most people, the first thing they say is, I didn't even know we had one. Uh, and I say, great, I'll tell you all about it. Uh, so what the, the image you see is the vaccine injury table, which is an administratively created table of officially recognized vaccine injuries. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So the vaccine court is a no-fault compensation court set up by a statute in 1986. So no-fault meaning they don't fight over negligence of a company, they fight over causation, whether your injury really should be compensated because it was actually caused, right? So it's not a negligence um, kind of uh, dispute. There are eight special masters who I will call judges interchangeably, but their true title is um, special masters. There are no juries. The special masters sit and individually hear the claims. The court is put in the court, U.S. Court of Federal Claims, which is a court that is set up for the U.S. to be to agree to be sued, right? So it's not um, there's no Seventh Amendment jury right because it's um, it's an Article One court, not an Article Three court. If that I can return to that if we need to. So all claims of vaccine injuries and deaths have to go to this court. Vaccine manufacturers are released from liability and the government steps in as the defendant. So all the cases are the secretary of HHS as the named defendant, def uh, defended by attorneys from the civil division of the Justice Department. All vaccines recommended for use in children are covered, and that includes, quite importantly, vaccines like the flu, the flu vaccine, that are widely used in adults but also recommended for children. So that's how something gets um, covered. It, it has to be one of those things. So for example, the Japanese encephalitis flu, uh, like the Japanese encephalitis that you get for travel would not be covered. Awards are paid from a trust fund that is funded by a 75 cent excise tax on every dose of vaccine. So as you can imagine, once something like the flu vaccine with 130 million doses, say distributed, there's a tremendous amount of money available in the trust fund. Petitioners get a lawyer who specializes in these cases and critically attorney's fees and expert witnesses witness costs are paid regardless of the outcome. So that's a, an unusually generous um, fee arrangement. It's not a contingency fee. So that has effects. Um, lawyers are not screening out cases. There, there's no risk to the attorneys to take petitions. And this was intentionally designed to make it easy to get a lawyer to make it easier for people to file these claims. So we have this vaccine injury table. And the way it's supposed to work is that if there's a recognizable, uh, accepted vaccine injury, it goes on the table and compensation is automatic. Now, the problem has been that very few claimed injuries are on the table, although a few more have been recently added. Um, the original idea was, oh, we'll just set up this table, we'll put what we know, and everybody will just quickly and easily get compensated. Well, that hasn't really been the way that it's worked out. It's turned out to be much more contentious with people really fighting over the causation and really fighting over what the evidence shows and whether we have good enough evidence. So this slide shows you a periodization of the court and it explains some of these shifts over time and why the court has become controversial. And one thing that's really interesting about this court is that it has recreated itself and become something completely different over time and responded to, um, to needs in very different ways with its, its, its justification <laughs> really shifting. So you see in the first, uh, what's called the founding period, and I should say I draw this periodization from the director of the program himself when I spoke to him about it. He put it in these terms and called the, these periods by these names. So when the court was first founded, it was founded uh, to settle claims about the whole cell pertussis vaccine with fairly generous definitions of what was caused by the whole cell pertussis vaccine. 
And that, that is, those claims are still 20%, 27% of the total to date. So a very large number of claims going through under quite gen scientifically generous definitions. This ended in 1994-95 when some studies came out and the, the scientific consensus shifted such that many of the conditions that were thought to be related and to have caused those harms uh, were no longer considered to be so, right? So the, the scientific consensus about what those injuries were really contracted and the table contracted definitionally. So a lot of its generosity went away. And this was, we entered this off table period where suddenly almost nothing that used to count as pretty easy compensation counted anymore. And as you can imagine, things became quite contentious then because you know, some attorneys that I spoke to said, you know, all of a sudden, all these claims just went away. We didn't have any cases that fit anymore and they fought about everything. Then the autism cases came along. And if you know anything about the periodization of when this occurred, you know, you know the Lancet Wakefield articles in 1998 by early 2000s, you have a flood of claims, um, and they ended up packaging them all together in what's called the omnibus autism proceedings, where they heard test cases over, over some years and then decided that vaccines uh, were not causing autism and didn't decline to compensate these as vaccine injuries. So it was a very large bolus of cases, all um, declined. So again, lots of controversy there, many, many people going uncompensated. And now we're in this very different period though where those, those controversies are behind us, but the people who are served by the vaccine court have, have radically changed over time. So most of the claims claimants are now adults making claims from the flu vaccine. Because as you can, as I said, once the flu vaccine got covered, it's covered because it's universally recommended for use in children, but there are of course many more adults than children getting the flu vaccine annually, right? So that's just the, quite a lot more people. And that's, those are the claimants now. So all of a sudden we've got this court that was supposed to be about children and the DTP vaccine. Now we, we don't have the DTP vaccine anymore, the whole cell one. It's not about children. <laughs> it's about um, very different things. So what gets compensated? So this is, as I say, syncope, which doctors, go, we, doctors call it syncope, we call fainting, right? So it's not a dead guy. That was, that was the best I could do for an image. Um, so there are some clear cases, and right, fainting after getting an injection is a clear, um, a clear adverse event that is not controversial that everyone agrees about. And you might think people don't get very injured from fainting, but actually, there, you know, if you plumb the cases, um, if you take a dive off an exam table and hit your head or hit your teeth and hit your face, um, you can end up pretty seriously injured. So when they say, uh, don't get up yet or, don't, or stand next to somebody before they, um, while they're, after, for a few minutes after they've gotten their vaccine, um, that, that is a thing. People do just take a dive. One young woman um, got a vaccine and then drove herself away and a few minutes later got into a car accident after experiencing syncope while she was driving because it can be delayed by a few minutes. And she had quite a serious car accident and that was compensable because it was a direct result of the vaccine. And that's not restricted to any particular vaccine that's injection related. So we, we also compensate um, for an injury called shoulder injury related to vaccine administration. That's when the needle goes in and inflames your arm. Guillain-Barre syndrome after the flu vaccine. If, when you get the flu vaccine, you notice there are several questions about whether you've ever had Guillain-Barre syndrome, right? Because this is a known um, possible adverse event and they really don't want to vaccinate you if you have a history of that. Um, there are connections to arthritis after the rubella vaccine. The live but weakened chickenpox vaccine can spread in the body and cause infection. Of course, anaphylaxis is a possible adverse event. Right? These are the clear cases that are widely agreed upon. Now there's an interesting middle ground. And these are what um, attorneys at the vaccine court used to call the under the table table cases, meaning these are not these don't have the kind of evidence that we can publicly put them on the vaccine injury table, but the vaccine court will regularly compensate for these, usually with a settlement, if you have a reasonable expert who can speak for you, even though the scientific evidence is not that 
strong, maybe, or isn't strong enough to reach expert consensus. And now 80% of their cases are disposed of by settlement, where what happens is the Justice Department attorneys put forth a stipulation and it says, look, we don't agree to causation. We don't agree that, fact, as a matter of fact, this vaccine caused this injury. But nonetheless, to expedite and solve this case, we will award $400,000. So, you know, they'll come up with a negotiated settlement for both the amount and uh, the, the status of the claim. Now, this is not at all surprising for lawyers, right? But this is a court that's supposed to be, that's charged with making scientific evidentiary decisions and some sort of muddled together thing put together by lawyers where nobody really agrees, but let's give you some money is not terribly satisfying from a scientific perspective, right? And these middle ground cases get a lot of scientific uh, criticism because, um, and, and an example of this would be like multiple sclerosis from uh, any number of different vaccines. There's not, uh, mainstream scientific experts would not concede that MS is caused by vaccines, but it has been uh, semi-regularly compensated um, depends a little bit on which special master you get. And what causes, what brings about just enough credibility is if a credible expert can articulate a plausible biological mechanism by which this could happen and there isn't another obvious uh, competing explanation. And folks do often have a very hard time getting credible experts, but there are some who regularly testi testify about um, particularly autoimmune diseases, demyelinating conditions, um, the kinds of things that one could plausibly get after an infection. So one could plausibly get them after a vaccine so those could be um, compensated. And so one view is this is kind of a lamentable mess, right? Uh, we're patching together this evidence. You've got these lawyers, these judges who don't really know anything. They're not scientific experts. Uh, why are they compensating for these things? Um, but what I argue in the book is that, you know, we have an obligation to have some kind of compensation system, and this actually uh, invites those claims and processes them in ways that are um, that are democratically defensible, and even uh, even desirable from a social perspective. So I'll say more about that at the end. But let me get through just another. Here's another view of the vaccine injury table. It's several pages long. What I showed you first was the very first page. So you can see what the, um, what the headings were. So here's one. You can see there are, there are not that many linked conditions. There's a few, right? Vasovagal syncope, that's the fainting. Uh, the shoulder injury, that's the injection that goes awry. Um, you see Guillain-Barre syndrome. Those were all added as of March 21st of this year. So those are very recent additions that previously, previously were in the automatically compensated but not really on the table category and now are really on the table. And I've, apparently this uh, serva, the shoulder injury category, is a really growing category. And actually when I gave an interview on WNYC and that's what they asked me about. So, um, and I got to say to whoever, however many people were listening in New York City, I don't know, yes, this is a real thing if this happens to you you can file a claim. Um, and that's a, that's a really interesting one because that, that injury is a person doing a bad job administering the vaccine, right? They, they put it too high, they get it in the wrong place. It's not, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the exact components of the vaccine. So it doesn't really fit the vaccine court model all that well, right? We should perhaps have traditional tort litigation to, dis, to deter people from having badly trained employees who give vaccines in the wrong place, right? You know, people ought to, this is a trainable problem, right? People ought to be able to deliver the vaccines in the right way. Um, now those people still can bring negligence suits for that, but the vaccine court also exists and I would, I would guess is a much more appealing option. You get a lawyer already paid for, fast track to compensation for a relatively low level injury that's not worth a whole lot to uh, to a tort lawyer. Um, so I think that's an interesting balance where it's clearly vaccine related. The court is stepping in to uh, have some compensation, 
But if what we really want is people to learn not to do that and to give the injections in the right way, um, and you know there are is a lot. There have been mobilization around getting people to to see this, to recognize this injury. Um, but the question is, would would a tort lawsuit maybe do a better job? But given the very small dollar amounts, um, it's unlikely that tort litigation would be the right way to draw attention to this problem. Okay. So by now you should see some really interesting organizational features of this court that make it what it is. So it, again, it deals with causation, not negligence. The, what I call this inquisitorial adversarial posture means that the special masters are both really directing things as well as overseeing the lawyers disputing between themselves. So in a way it's sort of a classic court setup with the, with the judge and then the, two, the adversarial attorneys but the special masters do get to ask questions and direct things in a bit more of an inquisitorial way. So they can really, and the key thing there is that they can really press people on what their evidence is. And there are, there are no juries, right? It's just before the special masters who hear these cases again and again and again. So they become subject matter experts, even though none of them are scientists, they're, they're attorneys um, who are appointed to these roles. So when I talk to people, about what the court was trying to do. They always use this phrase, science versus policy. We're trying to balance science versus policy. And then I would say, well, what does that mean? What is science? What is policy? What do you, <laughs> what do you take yourselves to be trying to figure out there? Um, and what they meant by science was real knowledge that vaccine injury has actually occurred. And by policy, they meant we are supposed to be compensating. We have all this money. We have this social contract. We're supposed to be compensating people so they don't go to the tort system and, and file lawsuits. So we, they felt a real pressure to make awards, right? They can't just hold all the money and say nothing counts as a vaccine injury. But yet they have to do it in a scientifically credible way. And this is, this is very, very challenging. They try to be as open as possible. So there's no Daubert rule. There's no evidentiary exclusions. Um, any witness can testify. Um, and those witnesses get paid for their time. So it's a real engine, a subsidized engine of evidence production for oppositional researchers. Pace is really important. Many scholars of law and science point out that one of the main problems with law and science is they proceed at different rates, right? The case gets filed, somebody wants to sue, and they keep pressing their motions, and it's, something's got to happen, right? And they're going to decide whether or not the study is finished, right? Or whether or not scientific knowledge has advanced to the point where we can make a good decision, right? The law has to decide usually quicker and sometimes without evidence. Well, what happens here is that the, they'll just delay. Oh, okay, you wanna see the results of this vaccine safety study? All right, we'll just hold your complaint and nothing will happen to it. You filed it, you got under the statute of limitations. Let's just hold it for like three years. You know, some of the, delays have been many, many years, um, but often waiting for, for evidence to see what might happen. So when I was observing this court, the attorneys really argue a lot about what the evidentiary standard should be, what the exact legal language ought to be. And of course, you know, being lawyers, they're very invested in what that precise language is and what the legal standard is. I thought, observing them, that that wasn't the game at all, really. I thought the real problem is that they just had a very difficult time figuring out what causation looked like and weighing all these different types of evidence. And what the legal standard, what the legal language overlaid on top of that was, wasn't really that much of, uh, so much of the issue. So now I'll talk to you about just a couple of instances um, where I'll try to give you a more vivid picture of what the evidence sometimes looks like and how people are disputing about it. So there are these explicit hierarchies of evidence. And these come through from the court itself, from the Institute of Medicine, all kinds of expert bodies have articulated, okay, this is really good evidence, this is slightly less good, this is you know, not kind of okay, but we really don't wanna rely on it. And this, at the top of the slide, you'll see what the mainstream hierarchy of evidence looks like. So if you can find something in a body, that's fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, 
a, a live vaccine virus, uh, evidence of a live of a vaccine virus persisting in the body and causing an infection. You know, fantastic. So that's lab reports from an actual body. That's pretty. That's rare. Uh, very, very few cases will have any evidence like that. Oftentimes, they're looking at epidemiology and surveillance. So this is, you know, is there a population level elevated risk of this kind of condition after having received this vaccine at a level that it that looks significant enough? Um, and the way they find out this information is through one of our surveillance systems called the Vaccine Safety Data Link. And this is um, a, a health surveillance system, a vaccine injury surveillance system made up of about nine HMOs. So Harvard Pilgrim is in it, um, a bunch of the Kaiser locations, California, the whole, the whole West Coast, Colorado, Wisconsin, uh, Georgia, and Minnesota, I think all have large HMOs that gather de-identified patient data. And you can actually look and see, have people who got this vaccine had a higher rate of some kind of outcome of interest. And the way that folks talk about this is, we're looking for a signal, and then we can do some kind of a causal analysis in this database. And uh, there are monitors running, running these things on a weekly basis, looking for upticks and testing for causal relationships in these uh, surveillance databases. But they also will rely on case reports and passive surveillance system reports, which is the, net, the bottom uh, option that I'll talk about in a minute. So it's, in a way, it's that the epidemiology and the population risk is really what's important, but they will often take a published case report, which is really just one case, right? One interesting case that's been published in a medical journal, and they will sometimes uh, use that as evidence for compensation. And so here I have a, I have a quote from the chief, former chief special master talking about you know, they acknowledge this hierarchy, but then here he is explaining what in a case they often really have to look at. So he says, uh, more often what we have is, quote, epidemiology evidencing a relative risk less than two, animal studies, case reports, anecdotal reports, manufacturing disclosures, physician desk reference citations, journal articles, IOM findings, novel medical theories, treating physician testimony, and non-dispositive but inferential clinical and laboratory findings. So that's more <laughs> the, the, the sea of evidence that they're looking at, and they're being asked to decide, is this, can, I, you know, how, can we say with 51% uh, you know, probability um, that this vaccine caused this injury? So for example, like the treating physician testimony, this is really interesting. How much weight should go to that? So this is the physician who's treated the person, right? They can talk about that, that person and what they think is going on with them. And in some cases, the vaccine judges have said, look, that's very important evidence, right? That's a medical expert who's looking at this person. On the other hand, a treating physician maybe doesn't know anything about epidemiology or what the latest uh, surveillance epidemiology shows, right? <laughs> so they have one particular kind of expertise, but are they more like, the, the mother, for example, who says, well, he was never the same, his behavior changed in this way, I know it's related. You know, how different is the physician from the epidemiologist and what is their different value in saying um, what the evidence shows? Now, of course, mobilized activists see the evidence very differently. And so by activists, I mean vaccine critical activists, folks who are opposed to most of what the vaccine court is doing because it's not compensating for things that they think it should be compensating for. And they, are, they have their own evidence, right? And uh, often a considerable amount of it coming from a lot of different sources. So here are some of their favorite sources are past compensated cases, right? If you got compensation before, doesn't that mean that that's a vaccine injury, right? Does the compensation validate that an injury occurred? Seems like it might except that I just told you about the negotiated settlements and, <laughs> and the way the evidence has shifted. And um, so they are, there's a, quite a lot of disagreement about what that means. There's a great deal of parental observation, right? And it's quite interesting to think about in what ways parents are experts and about what precisely, what kinds of knowledge do they have? How does that differ from other kinds of knowledge? 
They also bring in vaccine package inserts, uh, which is, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are required to put every possible adverse events from clinical trials in the package insert. So you can find all kinds of scary things in there. They're not causally validated, um, but it's a frequent, like, hey, this is written on this package insert, and it sounds really scary, and look, the pharmaceutical company themselves wrote this. So that uh, is, is compelling in some cases. But the favorite uh, parallel database is this Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, rhymes with VAERS. Um, and this is a public database, anyone can report to it, where you report a vaccine injury that has happened. So it's, I mean, it's literally VAERS.gov. You, know, you, you can look it up, it's right there, it's online. It's a passive surveillance system, meaning it's like a trap just for things to come to it, right? It doesn't judge anything. Um, manufacturers are required to report to it any adverse event that comes out of any of their clinical trials. Doctors and health professionals are required to report it if they think a patient has, um, has experienced a vaccine reaction. Um, attorneys report to it. You know, there was an interesting thing with the, when the autism cases were coming up, lots of uh, VAERS reports were being filed for autism, which were then traced back to the attorneys because then they can, start, they can file the cases and then they can say, look at all those VAERS reports, <laughs> right? You can produce it and then jump out at the other side and point back to it, right? It has that nice feature because it's open. It's an open passive surveillance system, which is what you have to have to, to detect signals, right? Remember, they're looking for the signals and it does work. There have been validated vaccine injuries that have been first detected through an uptick in VAERS reports where, hey, that looks a little weird, that many infants should not be suddenly clustering with those cases, let's have a look at that in the vaccine safety data link where we can perform actual statistical um, you know, operations to see if, there's a, if there really is a causal link. What you find with activists is a lot of journal articles and, um, and headlines using only VAERS data, you know, with the, but without a causal explanation um, without a causal test and all it all it says is people think this happened right <laughs> it's a record of that but it is often used um, causally in causal arguments and then of course you can get journal articles published this is another whole digression I won't go into but many of you who've been following this issue know that there are literally hundreds of fake journals Right, or journals of <laughs> different levels of fakeness, right, where you can pub anybody can get anything published and make it look nice and then uh, channel it back around and submit it as evidence. Um, and so there are plenty of journal articles often drawing on VAERS database uh, evidence that say all kinds of things about vaccine injuries. So here I was in the vaccine advisory committee meeting, listening in, just hanging out. And uh, the mother, there's a, there's a spot on the committee for a parent of a vaccine injured child. And so the woman who held one of those positions said this to um, the, the official from the National um, Vaccine Program Office. And she's asking, you know, why is my child not your evidence? It's like, why did you never call me and want to look at my child? Right, and so she, she couldn't figure out why there was not this interest in her child as evidence. And this is, this is a combination of the, the past compensations being good evidence, but also, uh, you know, don't you want to look and test her? Wouldn't her, her body, her tissues hold some clues for you? And so the National Program Office guy had a sort of awkward response where he was talking about, Oh, we do have a, a bio bank, which actually hardly captures anyone who goes to the court because they have to get specimens right away, not years later, so it doesn't really match up. But basically, he, he was not interested in, in that kind of evidence, right? But it was very awkward for him to try to explain that. And so that just shows some of the disconnect between what appears as compelling evidence to the government officials and also to the most vaccine court judges and what parents are thinking when they have past compensations and they have a child that nobody seems interested in studying. Okay, so I'm 
wrapping up here. All right. So I'll just skip ahead to the argument that I make at the end, which is, you know, what does this vaccine court do for our immunization social order? How does it maintain it exactly? And how does it do it as a court? So first, it has fulfilled its original gatekeeping mechanism. It was designed as a way to keep lawsuits from bankrupting and dry, or driving manufacturers out of the business, right? Not bankrupting them, but making it not, so, not desirable for them to manufacture vaccines anymore because they would be hit with lawsuits that were unpredictable and possibly costly. So in the, in the 80s, it did look like a couple of vaccine manufacturers were gonna stop making vaccines and we might not have any manufacturers for some vaccines. So it has um, shielded our vaccine supply from this unpredictability and volatility. And the, the main thing there is a counterfactual, which is if the autism cases had not had to go to vaccine court and be decided uh, slowly, carefully, without juries, and after years of evidence development, um, and say, you know, attorneys were really pushing to get some of these claims out of vaccine court and in front of juries around 2001 or 2002, before the major studies um, showing safety had come out. And they were, for example, looking to, um, to create class actions that would have covered up to 175 million people. So a couple of jury verdicts there, which we would later come to see as regrettable given the evidence development, would have been earth shattering in terms of um, our vaccine program and faith in it. And you know, once that kind of thing got out there, turning it around and convincing people would have been very, very difficult. The vaccine court was there, absorbed those claims, brought them into a long drawn out process, again, paid everybody and took, you know, took the, um, took, absorbed that issue and, and resolved it. So the court is second, both an engine and an audience for evidence, right? So it hears the evidence and people produce evidence knowing they're going to bring it to vaccine court, but it also literally subsidizes it. You know, many of the vaccine critics over the years have billed the vaccine court for their research studies using the VAERS database and things like that. Um, you build them for expert services and then testified claiming that vaccines cause these injuries and were able to get steadily compensated for years and years for this. Now you might say it's really terrible that we compensated folks for doing bad research that turned out to be incorrect. On the other hand, I think it's good that folks were allowed and given every possible chance to develop their arguments. And, um, and it invested them in doing that. We were able to uh, bring people to the table to make arguments in a certain kind of way. And you know, after a while, it gets hard to <laughs> keep seeing another VAERS study when you're like, well, it's actually not causal. <laughs> you know? um, and after a while, people making those arguments don't get listened to anymore. But for a long time, they were literally subsidized, and I think that's important. So third, the vaccine injury system expresses our ethical obligations. If we're going to have a system of vaccines uh, promoted by law and backed with legal coercion, when something does go wrong, we have to have a compensation system. Now, regrettably, I say in the book, this really only matters so much because we have often no other social safety net for people, say, with uh, lifelong disabilities. <laughs> Right? We don't generously compensate people who have been injured for any reason um, in, in that context of otherwise not being generous. Uh, we should at least step in in one case where um, we know there's a causal injury. And critically, the fourth thing is that the vaccine court diffuses dissent. It has drawn people into it. It has caused them to make arguments in certain kinds of ways. People who have been compensated are generally pretty happy with that. Um, it has kept those folks from being part of social movements and uh, perhaps quite sympathetic ones because they would have much better cases than the folks who are left uncompensated. So it diffuses dissent in ways that we know the courts do by bringing in social movement actors um, and drawing their attention into making legal arguments, presenting evidence and making those kind of arguments as opposed to doing something else uh, that could be um, more burdensome to absorb for the immunization social order. 
And the last thing that, that I quite like about it is it holds critics accountable. If people want, want to make arguments again and again and again based on the same data that uh, there's a significant scientific consensus against, you know, they have to keep bringing it back and they're going to be asked questions about it. They're going to be cross-examined about it. Um, and you know, we, will, we will have those conversations within the vaccine court. And otherwise, you know, in media, on blogs, in, in mom support groups, you know, there's no, these are not accountability regimes in any of these other places. Uh, this is the only site for um, really pressing people on what their evidence is. And even if one takes a very capacious view of the evidence, which I think we should, um, we still need to really press on those claims. And other institutions and other sites for debating vaccine injuries do not allow for this. And in fact, magnify, um, some incorrect views in ways that are worrisome. So those are all the reasons that I think the vaccine court has, has done a good job at uh, what it was asked to do, even as it has evolved over the years into many different kinds of institutions. So thank you, and I would be happy to discuss any of this with you. I have two questions, please. First is, how much is in that fund? I mean, uh, 75 cents per inoculation. About $4 billion. Okay. 3.5, maybe, you know, wait, a lot. Okay, and the secondly, you said early on that they, the, they had a holding that the um, autism is not a result of vaccines. Is that a closed story then? Is there no new research, no, no new concerns that come up that might make them revisit that? Well, they have said they'll hear cases if there's new evidence. Um, they held, they did six test cases on different versions of the causation theory, you know, thimerosal, measles, um, and they took themselves at the time to be quite exhaustively covering um, the scientific literature. There were 900 medical articles entered into evidence, for example, um, and, they, and they have said we will hear cases based on new evidence, and they have not, that has not, gone anywhere yet. You know, people have not been able to come up with new evidence. The attempts to reinvigorate that have been more or less the same theories that were um, closed off before. So, so they'd, be it, they'd be open to new evidence if they found some? They would. They, okay. they have said that. Uh, thank you. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, I have about three questions. First. Can you tell, tell us where the court actually sits? Is it in DC? It's in DC in the Court of Federal Claims. It's a very nondescript brick building right near the White House. It's beautifully located right, I mean, right next is, to Is it right next to the VA on G or H Street? It's at 14th and I don't remember. 14th, okay. I'm not sure. You um, seem to have a clearer grasp of the geography than I do. <laughs> the, the judges who have been appointed or the special masters are they truly independent and impartial in your view? Well, they are, well here, I'll give you the answer and you can decide about their appointment structure. They are appointed for four year terms and they are appointed by the Court of Federal Claims Judges, which is a panel of judges who are themselves appointed for 15 year terms. So, and they are, they are generally reappointed for the four year terms. So on the one hand, they're not, they're not article, uh, three lifetime appointments, right? They're not lifetime appointed judges. On the other hand, four-year terms appointed by people who have 15-year terms sounds like a pretty attenuated and protective system to me. So I think they are fairly uh, autonomous, but okay. you judge for that. And do the lawyers from the civil division of the AG's office, uh, do they cooperate and consult with lawyers and scientists from the uh, vaccine manufacturers, or do they kind of just stay independent, or what? The vaccine manufacturers step way back from this, right? Because they've secured liability, right? So, you know, they are, they send representatives to all these meetings. You know, when I was always there, there was always me and some, and a vaccine, you know, a GSK representative or something who was willing to talk to me informally, but never on the record. <laughs> You know, so they're sort of there watching things. They were at all these important meetings, um, but 
you know, for them, the system is functioning very well. They're not particularly engaged with it. They're not engaged with the attorneys, the Justice Department attorneys. Okay, and lastly, when, when a new vaccine comes onto the market, is there some sort of agreement between the vaccine manufacturer and the Justice Department as to anything uh, in, in order for the Justice Department, for, for the United States to assume liability uh, on these vaccines? It has to be universally recommended for, for use in children. So universally recommended by whom? By, by ACIP, the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Mm -hmm. right, so it has to go through all of the, the, the bodies that approve and recommend vaccines for children. Um, and there have in the past been more burdensome recommend ways to then get it into the vaccine program and they've streamlined that as much as possible to try to make sure that when it's accepted for use in children, it's, it's included in the program. Okay. Is ACIP itself sort of a uh, sort of controlled or heavily influenced by the vaccine manufacturers? It's those folks are appointed, I believe for four year terms by HHS and they're, um, you can, look, you can look online at who they are. They're prof immunology professors, pediatrics professors um, from all over the country and they rotate around. They do have conflict of interest rules, um, although one can, you know, have worked in the vaccine industry and still get on those appointments. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I'm curious about who the uh, special, uh, what do you call them, special masters? Special masters. Are, 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 are they judges? I call them judges. Their official title is special masters, which really means somebody appointed by a job, by a judge to do a judicial job. So they really work for the Court of Federal Claims. Um, but in their past life, do they tend to be judges or they tend to be the attorneys or do they tend to be epidemiologists or what would what, what's none their of background? them are epidemiologists okay. yeah, yeah they yeah. they tend to be attorneys and it's changed a little bit over time they um, tended to come from elsewhere in the civil division of the justice department like the tax division um, but m more recent appointments have been have had more variable backgrounds so one woman was a former army judge mm -hmm. they have a former municipal judge but most of them were not judges before they were some they were attorneys somewhere in the federal government before. And do they have any special training when they come on the court? Any uh, sort of, let's get you up to speed on these issues or no? Now, I don't know if they have some kind of internal training yeah. that I don't know about, but um, they don't have science degrees. They don't have PhDs. They, yeah, don't, you no, know, they tend to have the BA and the JD and some experience working in government and mm. not experience in science or immunology or vaccines. And, and, and when you showed us that list, I was sort of uh, struck by how soon the events were happening. Most of them were, you know, within 48 hours and then some were as long as two months. But some of the autoimmune stuff might, might be much later. Um, do, do, they, do they consider longer term um, I mean, they issues? do. Those are some That's of the really middle hard. ground cases that yeah. have, right. But That's you know, really you, hard. you've really hit on something because the, the adverse event detection system is pretty good at detecting an uptick, a Short signal term. in a dramatic event that triggers a medical record, like for which someone goes to the emergency room or seeks medical care. Th that's right. proximal to the That's vaccine. reasonably proximal yeah. and can be, yeah. That kind of thing, the surveillance is, is gonna pick at. up. And again, these are, they're looking on a weekly basis. So, you know, if I haven't heard that a vaccine is causing some sort of dramatic thing that would get somebody to go to the hospital, I'm pretty sure that's not happening then. Right. Because I know the, the, you know, the lack of surveillance evidence means what? Right. So in, if it's a, if it's an easily detectable kind of thing that triggers a medical record in reasonably proximate time right. and you don't see it, you can be pretty confident it's not there. But yeah, the longer de developmental things that are more, much more attenuated, that have multiple yeah, or really poorly tough. understood causes. Right. Yeah. This is the, this is the tricky area. Yeah. And if they can get a credible expert to articulate a, a causal mechanism, then they can get a compensation, even though mainstream doctors will still say, you know, the epidemiology doesn't support the multiple sclerosis link, for right. example. But yeah, different kinds of conditions, different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of certainty. Right. It's very interesting stuff. So, so just a quick follow up to, to his question. Um, do you think it's a good thing or uh, that there is no medical expertise by this panel? Or do you think it would be improved if it did have 
medical expertise? I don't think there's no medical expertise. Or do you mean in their own personal biographies, or oh, that they are just lawyers, right. um, <laughs> just lawyers, <laughs> right? As someone who, without medical expertise, opining on this topic, right? Um, I, I mean, I actually think in terms of the democratization, you get more eyes on it, more professional spheres taking responsibility for it. I do see the diffusion as desirable, um, especially when you put people in repeated contact. You know, they they are they hear these cases over and over and over, hundreds a year, and they sit for you know five, ten, fifteen years. Um, I mean, this is a whole question. You know, how how can we trust lay people with these complex decisions, and they're not exactly lay people. They're a nice middle ground. I think they're, they are, they are the kinds of people we have to be able to convince with scientific evidence, right? Um, and and they get this very special, sustained context to do it with expert witnesses helping them out. I mean, they get to hear expert witnesses. They talk to families. You know, they get to see a really nice range of evidence about it. So I'm not. I am untroubled by that because. I view this as something that needs to be democratically open within, an, within a reasonable set of institutional parameters. Um, and I think that it has achieved that, which is a bit hopeful in our context, I think. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, in the context of the patent system, what actually requires, this is following up on these questions, that requires additional education to legal education, if there is any mechanism for requiring that of the special masters, the additional education in addition to legal background? That's my first question. Well, everything about them is governed by this statute, the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986. And I tell the long, depressing story in the book about how there have been all these efforts and even bipartisan agreement and all kinds of agreement to make amendments to it that have never made it through Congress. So whatever you want to do to it has to go through amendments from Congress. And there has perfectly wonderful ideas like extending the statute of limitations. The, the benefits are not keyed to any index and have not been adjusted since 1986. You know, terrible, terrible problems that we have not gotten Congress to be able to fix. So that would, first, that would have to go through there. But second, you know, I don't think it would address a problem because I don't see I mean, in a way, increased specialization, even more than they have, I think, you know, it can lead to funneling and narrowness yeah. and uh, professionalization in an undesirable way. So I wouldn't be in favor of that because I don't think it addresses a problem and because I want to keep it more open. Um, the, other, <laughs> the other question I have is um, the influence of the new administration. Um, what, it, what influence can it have on the vaccine court. Um, I saw a, an article about Robert Kennedy probably possibly chairing a special um, vaccine safety committee and um, wondering what your thoughts are on that. That, the, the Robert Kennedy idea seems to be mercifully forgotten. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that there had been, our president's attention span and interest in that has not been sustained, and I, uh, hopefully that will continue to be the case. But politically, there is not there are not a group of congressmen on either side of the aisle who really want to take this up. Even the Republican um, Congress people who have who have in the past bitten at this issue are not interested. Uh, it's a political loser. Vaccines are fairly widely popular, and uh, it's not it's not politically appealing as an issue in Congress. Now he could appoint some kind of blue ribbon committee and. And they could certainly generate publicity, um, you know, and that would be distracting and, in my view, damaging. It, you know, he, he certainly could do that. Now, influencing the rest of the system is much more difficult because vaccine policy is made at the state level. You know, the actual requirements for school and all those, those are all matters of state law. And uh, like, as I described, the, um, the appointment process, like if you wanted to change the vaccine court judges, the mechanism for doing that is, you know, you, you got to change who they choose on the Court of Federal Claims, and then there's all these people who have four-year terms that, you know, so influencing who gets on the vaccine court would be difficult. The main way might be influencing the posture of the Department of Justice attorneys, you know, to say, just start conceding things and not, uh, and compensating more, more things and to change their adversarial posture that's something that it, the executive could do through the Justice Department. Um, but the, the, mechani the, act, the mechanisms are not th that clear. Um, 
and they take sustained attention and knowledge of how exactly all these policy mechanisms work, <laughs> which, you know, it doesn't seem that our president has. So I'm not that, I'm not too concerned, but, you know, I was wrong about uh, the election, for example. <laughs> I was like, don't worry, Michigan's not in play. <laughs> Yeah, I had to drink a pumpkin spice latte for that. <laughs> I said, I'll drink a pumpkin spice latte. If you, you know. Anyway, so then I, I had to do it. At least, uh, what's his, Sam Wong from Princeton had to eat a bug. So it wasn't that bad. Uh, comment and a question, just as a response to this idea of having more ex experts involved. I think I'm a bit more in agreement that having more players uh, outside of lay people might not be a good thing. A lot of bioethics involves panel discussions where you have uh, you know, a number of experts and a lay person by law, and, and that's always been a good thing in, in, in a lot of those cases because the incentive of the, this structure is for these claims to be paid, not to have gridlock inevitably uh, by definition by having all these competing interests. Um, what has been your awareness of sort of similar structures or a lack thereof in other countries, um, in particular in, in the UK, um, but also now in, in greater Europe where you're starting to see major health impacts from uh, vaccine rates going down? Um, so we do, there are 19 other compensation systems. I'll try to answer your question in two ways from my other we're the only country that puts it in a court with lawyers fighting each other. Um, other countries tend to, because they have national health care systems, they locate it much more bureaucratically within their national health care. Uh, so uh, Finland, for example, just has an insurance, uh, an insurance adjuster decides about the vaccine injuries. Um, Japan uh, and Taiwan have expert panels, so it's, it's not adversarial or judicial at all. It's just expert panels. So they, they do have different, different ways of handling this, very different than ours. It's interesting. They have roughly similar compensation rates, although it's pretty hard to tell because they, you're not comparing the same thing. They, they cover different vaccines. And some compensation systems are actually quite a bit less generous than ours, but often they're maybe roughly comparable. Um, so that's a little bit. And here, um, here are some comparable compensation solutions that we have in the US um, where we've decided for whatever reason that this social problem needs to be taken out of the courts in its usual way and we need to make up something special for it. Um, so we had, I call them disaster schemes, protective and ongoing schemes, broad no fault, and then ones where we might have needed one but failed to produce it, so then we're just living with the consequences, which is asbestos. Um, and then some kind of hybrid systems that we've, we've come up with. Um, so for example, workers' compensation, we just couldn't have all those cases in our regular tort system, right? We have a, an alternative thing because workers' compensation is so important. Keeping people able to work is uh, you know, deeply socially important. Um, you know, if we wanna have a nuclear industry, it has to be insured in a different kind of way because those accidents are not insurable in the normal way that we have, right? Um, and the, the vaccine case is kind of like that. Like if we're gonna have vaccines and we're gonna have vaccine mandates, we need something special. Um, so what I argue in the book is that it's, um, it shows that this is an ongoing need, something we've decided we can't live without, um, and it's a civic duty, you know, like going to work, like being, you know, being a productive citizen. Um, did that, both those slides sort of answer your question? I guess it has something in my mind more to do with you know, how, whether or not there's a runaway effect uh, with, with people sort of in, in the activism side of uh, the piece, I guess. Runaway, what do you mean um, by runaway? In terms of litigiousness, I mean, we're uniquely litigious in this country, but. Well, we are and we aren't. Actually, I mean, we're not the only people that have ever done it. Yeah, we did this in a really, in a fairly litigious way. Although this, the vaccine court is still really small. Oh, um, I, I don't think the vaccine court is that. I mean, actually, I'm surprised at how how well it contains that. 
and I'm w wondering if it, there's a sort of uh, alternate history playing out somewhere. You know, that would, this is a really great dissertation project for somebody with, say, for example, other language skills. You know, what, what is the vaccine injury politics in Thailand? You know, I don't know, but I'd love to find, you know, this is what I'm trying to tell, you know, an international compar you know, comparative transnational project about this where somebody really has the research skills to get into the, uh, you know, into the legal angle and the, um, you know, what's going on in these alternate systems. There's nothing written about it. We really don't know at all. Um, I don't think, I, I don't, haven't heard anything, but since there's no research coming out, then I, I just don't know, and it would be great to know. So, yeah, really, any other kind of vaccine system, the politics of other vaccine safety systems, if, if you can speak the languages of any of these countries or other, other countries where they're um, debating what kind of vaccine safety system to have, like India, great, great sites for doctoral work. Great, thank you. Um, I was wondering whether or not the judgments from the vaccine court ever then influence the scientific consensus, if it circles back the other way. So if it, one would be whether or not it affects the scientific community's view, if there is in fact, if they're finding a lot of compensation in these middle ground cases, for instance, if then the scientific community is more willing to view something as causal, or if there have ever been cases of a lot of compensation happening and then it affecting what ASIP, I think that's the right acronym, decides to do about what vaccines are mandated. You know, nothing is coming to mind on either of those. It's, a, it's pretty one way for the, for the expertise. Um, it's more the experts worrying about decisions coming down that they don't think are scientifically supportable that are scaring people. <laughs> and, then, and then they're getting, you know, getting upset about that. Uh, this is a fascinating model of a court system that actually I've never seen before, was never aware of before. How do you think this would have applied to say the smoking cases and or the Agent Orange cases, which we have up there on the slide, but I'm not clear on, on what happened there? Well, so those are cases where, well, in the smoking, right, we had political and litigation solutions to that, right? You know, so there were, there were the lawsuits that, you know, went on for years, that, and we still, we still have tobacco companies, right? It didn't, you know, they found other markets. Um, so, and of course, there maybe it's, we wanted to drive them out of business, we don't want to preserve them, or... I mean, to me, that I'm not, I'm untroubled by that. That's that's our system at work. It's the uh, you know, and many scholars know a lot more about this, and there are great books about the the smoking issue and how that played out. But that's that's an example of our system working under under normal conditions. Uh, and how about Agent Orange? Yeah, the Agent Orange. They yeah, they had a settlement that sort of fell apart. And a lot of people didn't get compensated, and they tried to come up with a compensation scheme. Um, you know, that one, it, re it receded in time because we stopped the event, you know, using it stopped, right? So it's not ongoing. Um, and so even though it, wasn't, it was solved in this kind of imperfect way, uh, just time, time moves on, and those people in that situation has, has moved on, so it's not quite as pressing. The uh, asbestos, is more kind of an ongoing train wreck <laughs> that we've never managed to solve. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. Lead, lead yeah, there's lead. Um, the, the Holocaust looted art case is actually quite interesting. You know, the Nazis sell millions and millions of dollars worth of art. It's scattered all around. How do we figure out what, who its rightful owner is? The people who own it maybe aren't the bad actors. They bought it legitimately. You know, we need some kind of international tribunal to, to create a solution to this. We haven't had one. The, you know, the, the art auction houses need to be compelled to pay into a fund, right? <laughs> you, know, this, you know, but we just don't have a mechanism to create that solution. Can you take one more question? <laughs> um, so actually, I, I am a, an attorney that practices um, not 
I, I, I handle vaccine injuries um, for a firm in, in um, Chicago. And um, I'm wondering, I, in trying to describe to friends what, what I'm doing, um, I, I am interested in how you would articulate for yourself, having done all this research, um, sort of the concise tension between sort of the shrill anti-vaxxers and then the profit-making pharmaceuticals and then the, you know, legally how we've decided as a, as a society to handle this through the no-fault system. How do, you dis how, how, how do you make the argument that this is the way we should be handling this and this is not avoiding, um, this is not pharmaceutical companies avoiding liability? I mean, it is clearly right. They are, well, yeah. but in a way that costs us too much, too much as a society, right? Or let, right? Because then you'd have to say, you know, pharmaceutical companies are doing things now that that are harmful, and they're getting away with things that they wouldn't be able to get away with otherwise. And the, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about the surveillance systems and the other vaccine safety systems that we have in place, which people know even less about than the vaccine. Court. You know, people just don't know that we have fairly good, not perfect, and I say why not perfect in the book, but you know, we have significant vaccine safety surveillance systems that have found and detected problems and immediately corrected them. So you know, there have been tests of our safety system that have been successful, so like the rotavirus, and there are several other examples um, for certain especially kind, dramatic kinds of problems. Um, so I would say, you know, we have this administrative system set up for the people who are injured by, by vaccines, which do happen, right? I would concede, right? They do happen. And in a society that promotes vaccination the way we do, we also have to promote uh, compensation for people who are injured. So, you know, there is, there is a, um, I, I do write about this in the book about how the attorneys are in often this kind of middle ground because they're not, they're not the anti-vaccine movement at, at all. The attorneys are quite, although there is some variation um, that I've noticed, but you know, the petitioner's bar is very, is a singular kind of institution uh, with these kinds of claims. And they really see how you know, there, there are some injuries and that, uh, and they're aware of many more than the normal population, than folks are aware of. Um, and they do happen and they should be compensated.